city of Vancouver, which is founded on the traditional and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. Hi, my name is Sophie King. I'm the Professional Learning and Events Coordinator at PIBC, and welcome to webinar number nine, Rethinking Planning and Social Justice. I would like to thank Stephanie Butler and others over at the Real Estate Foundation of British Columbia for sponsoring this webinar, which enabled us in turn to present it for free for, uh, for everyone to view. So thank you, Stephanie and company over at REFBC. We have an impressive lineup of speakers, which I will introduce in a moment. I wanted to let you know that we did approach Hogan's Alley, inviting them to participate in the webinar, but they were not able to provide a speaker at this time. I had also invited Gabriel Peters, who is an accessibility advocate and instructor at SFU to provide an accessibility component, component to the webinar, but employing the suitable technology to enable her to participate at this time was not possible. We just didn't have enough time or the budget to install the type of technology that she needed in order to fully participate. However, Gabriel did open my eyes um, to how much more we need to do here at PIBC in order to make our programs more accessible to all. And I will be working with Gabriel on this and we look forward to her participation in a webinar in the spring. And now I am pleased to introduce our esteemed panel of presenters. We have, first off, Tasha Henderson, board member of an organization called Women Transforming Cities. Second, we have Gwen Bridge, principal of Gwen Bridge Consulting and a member of the Saddle Lake Cree Nation and an advocate for Indigenous communities. And finally, um, our program ends with Erin Rennie, Senior Planner of the Regional Planning and Housing Services Division of Metro Vancouver. You can find their bios on our website. So welcome to our speakers. I'm very excited about the topic today, which is Rethinking Planning and Social Justice. So now I will invite Tasha to turn on her webcam and her mic. And while she is doing that, I will load her presentation. Hi, is this working? Hi, Tasha. Yeah, we can hear you quite well. And I hope everyone else can. Um, there you go. Awesome. Thanks, Sophie. Um, good afternoon. You're very welcome. Oh. <laughs> good afternoon, everyone. I'm really excited to um, be here with you today. Um, thanks for joining me on your lunch break or your couch or um, wherever you happen to be coming from. Um, I myself am coming from uh, New Westminster, which um, is located on the unceded um, traditional territories of the Hulkamilam and Skohomish um, speaking peoples. Um, we've recently been in conversations about how to do land acknowledgement in New West, um, or I've been in conversations. Um, and traditionally, we've mentioned the Kakite First Nation, which is sort of the most um, well known for New West. Um, but certainly there are a lot of, um, this is the territory of a lot of different nations. Um, and I think what it boils down for me is, is uh, you know, instead of worrying about getting it right, um, and we'll talk about that sort of as we explore the concept of intersectionality, um, to think about the spirit and the um, sentiment that you're bringing to a land acknowledgement. So um, I am new in all, you know, uh, iterations of the word to the fight for climate justice, for racial justice, for gender um, equity. Um, and so, uh, you know, and the folks who have been stewarding this land since time immemorial have been um, shouting from their rooftops for quite some time that um, we need to take more action. So I think that um, 
approaching this work with humility and an ability to listen is really um, key. And it's key for the topic that I'm going to be exploring with you here today as well. Um, so my name is Tasha. As Sophie said, I'm a board member with Women Transforming Cities. I've been a board member for four years now. Um, I'm also here as a white settler. I'm here as a mother. Um, I'm a social policy planner um, and I'm a resident of Metro Vancouver. And also I'm keen on using Canva to make my presentation. So these slides never quite line up uh, as well as a PowerPoint. So apologies in advance for that. So uh, Women Transforming Cities, um, who are we? So our history is that we are founded in 2009. Um, in council chambers, our co-founder Ellen Woodsworth uh, launched uh, women Transforming Cities um, out of the uh, Women's Advisory Committee with the City of Vancouver. We've been a small but mighty volunteer-run organization since then. We have our first staff person this year. It's very exciting. Um, and so we're growing and we're building capacity and, and it's a really exciting time for our organization. Um, our vision is to live in cities where all self-identified women and girls in all their diversity have real social, economic, and political power. Um, and we do that by advocating for policy change that supports gender equity to create women-friendly cities. Our mission, as you can see there, is to transform our cities into spaces that work for all people by empowering self-identified women and girls through community engagement, inclusive policies, and equitable, which I'm noticing has a spelling error, uh, representation. So we do this by looking, um, critically examining social, economic, and environmental issues using a gendered intersectional lens. And I'll explain what that means so that we're all on the same page as we move forward. Um, and that's what brings me here today, to ask that you commit in your own role, whatever that may be, um, and whatever department you find yourself in, um, to make your cities, your respective cities, uh, women-friendly. So why do we think this needs to happen at the municipal level? Um, when I say that cities aren't designed for women or that this isn't a women-friendly city, um, I know what many people start thinking, um, that this is a pretty good place to be a woman. Um, they think about what's happening in other places around the world, and sure, it, it could be worse. Um, so I agree with you. This is a great place to live. Um, I am proud to raise my kids here. Um, but that doesn't mean that cities are designed to serve women in the same way that they serve men. After a decade of working with regional women serving agencies on every issue imaginable, um, we see the common thread through those calls to action really clearly. Um, that cities are often leaving diverse, especially racialized women and girls behind, uh, maintaining the systems and structures that keep them underrepresented, socially isolated, and at increased risk for poverty. It's no surprise to any of you working um, in cities that um, cities are facing unprecedented social, economic, uh, environmental pressures around the world. Here in BC is, is no um, exception, and you're being asked to solve a lot of problems that aren't necessarily in your jurisdiction. Um, but ensuring that you're meeting the needs of a demographic that makes up roughly half of your community members um, becomes your responsibility. So being women friendly is exactly the work of cities in our mind. And so here we are, um, it's 2020. We're still seeing indigenous women um, going missing and being murdered at astronomical numbers. Uh, women are earning less. Women are choosing between work and parenting without childcare options. That's only been exasperated by COVID. Um, women are couch surfing, living in cars um, because of the lack of affordability in our region. Uh, women are still taking on the, the predominantly the, um, the majority of domestic labor, including all of those green things like, um, you know, shopping or using uh, recyclable packaging and composting and cloth diapers and all those sorts of things. Um, and women are underrepresented in every area of civic life from elected officials to public engagement. And those who do decide to run or get involved are faced with sexist, ageist, racist rhetoric um, on the daily. So there are, I mean, there are a million ways in which we see that cities are really letting women and girls down. But my key takeaway today um, is that planning is not neutral. Whether it's community programs, transit, parks, planning, um, or within social policy like food security, childcare, housing, 
women use and are impacted by city policies very differently than men and in unique ways. So without thoughtful intention, planning will, in you know, it'll continue to support the same structures that maintain this gender inequality. We can't fix these problems in our cities until we name them. We currently don't have, uh, you know, a standard framework in municipal policymaking that goes beyond looking at the gender gap to really looking at how women in all their diversity interact with the city differently than men. We've outlined um, 11 key priority areas for action that affect women in cities in our Hot Pink Paper campaign, which is a campaign that we run um, during the Vancouver, City of Vancouver's municipal election. And we have candidates sign on to which policy changes they are willing to um, adopt once in, in council. And then we try to hold them accountable. Um, I just wanna quickly touch on two today. Um, Housing. Oh, are we really going to go there today? Uh, we don't need to talk about the housing crisis. Uh, we're all in very deep around how to solve the housing crisis as planners. Um, but have you thought recently about how the housing crisis disproportionately affects women? Um, there are additional pathways to homelessness that women face, including the lack of affordable childcare, lower wages, gender-based violence. Um, they're far more likely, as I said before, to live in their cars, to couch surf, making them ineligible for many housing supports or programs um, because they're not actually considered homeless at that time. But beyond the obvious, uh, women's housing needs um, are also um, changing sort of as cities are changing. Uh, families are often being pushed further from city center into suburban areas with basement suites perhaps, um, as there are fewer and fewer um, larger apartment units uh, where there are, there's less public transportation options in housing arrangements like that, less access to services if needed, um, or women transitioning out of the prison system can't get their kids out of care um, because they can't find adequate housing. Um, there's just a number of different ways that housing really impacts women in a different way. And even when we think about women who could afford a new build, um, have you been in them recently? <laughs> I know that we're trying to like maximize space in these micro units, but by doing so, we're often not thinking about women's needs. They're, women, as we know, still do the majority of the household labor, um, and we can't like reach the top cupboard. They're right to the ceiling. Um, statistically, you know, size-wise, it's not, it's not uh, working. And in micro suites and even older apartments, there's no storage for strollers or car seats. Um, or as someone pointed out to me the other day that um, things that might help out urban families, like a cargo bike, for example, um, there's just nowhere to store that inside your inside your unit. I have a number of friends who live in um, apartments that park their stroller in their kitchen every night. Transportation is another big one. Um, women get around the city really differently than men. Our needs are different. We're going to different places at different times. 60% um, of women don't own cars in this region, um, and more women ride transit than men. But there are limited routes during the days. Um, there's no transit going to suburban areas where families may be living. Um, buses can't accommodate like a whole, you know, a bunch of different strollers. Bus fares continue to increase, um, or transit might stop running at night when um, a lot of women might be coming off of doing shift work, um, or sex workers might need a ride home. So, and if buses do run at night in less dense areas, the walk from the bus stop or the house um, might be unlit and feel unsafe. Um, or we can look at cycling. Um, less than one third of, of cyclists are women. Why? Um, I'm not sure, but maybe that's the perception of safety, the presence of street harassment, um, or the fact that we're usually the ones hauling our kids around um, and cargo bites are expensive and we tend to worry about the safety of our kids on the road. Um, so we see that bike lanes aren't really working for women as they're you know, currently doing right now. Um, I would argue to say that most, if not all, housing or transportation strategies fail to address gender in any real way. There's really no mention of gender in most plans at this level. Um, land use, transportation, like green initiatives, housing. Um, 
they're all sort of described as if just it, as it, it's just neutral. <laughs> but planning isn't neutral. Best planning practice isn't neutral. Um, it isn't one size fits all, or we wouldn't continue to have these inequities. Um, we know from data that policy either maintains or decreases um, in inequity. And the current status quo not only fails to support the full inclusion and participation of some groups, but also maintains the exclusion of women from public spaces and sports. So how do we tackle this? Um, I will explore three ways. Oh. Um, I will explore um, three different ways, and I'll start with um, gendered, using a gendered intersectional lens. And intersectionality is certainly a big buzzword these days. Um, and it's been co-opted to mean a few different things. Um, so I'll explain um, the, how we're using it um, so that we're all um, on the same page. Um, I am a white woman. I am by no means any expert in intersectionality. Um, but I do think that um, as a white uh, person who has a lot of access um, to spaces and to platforms like this. I do have a responsibility um, to do some an education piece. Um, so that's why um, we take this on. So we all have our own unique histories and experiences that determine who we are, how we relate to each other, um, how we live in our communities, and our identities are complicated and nuanced. Um, there are so many parts of ourselves that inform how we interact with our environments, how we access systems. These are certainly just a few. Um, you know, I would say that in planning, things like home ownership, um, uh, status, documentation status, um, indigeneity, um, uh, all, you know, there's just a whole host of other things that really um, play. I mean, there's wheels that are far more complicated than this um, because this diagram is much too simple. People don't fit nicely into any of these categories. Um, women are not just a homogenous group um, when we're talking, you know, if we're just going to focus in on gender, for example. Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw, a black legal scholar, first formally introduced the term intersectionality in 1989, and she was writing about discrimination in the US justice system. She described how sexism is experienced differently when it's compounded with racism. She pointed out that black women experience sexism and the resulting discrimination and oppression much differently than white men. Black women also experience racism differently than black men. Black women, she wrote, have a unique experience of discrimination tied to where those personal identities intersect. Those identities are the roads and the policies are the traffic. Um, and we need to examine where the policies come together to see and to tell a story of the discrimination and oppression that people experience. Forms of oppression like xenophobia, sexism, racism, classism, heterosexism, etc., are overlapping. Um, creating multiple levels of social injustice. And this isn't the oppression Olympics. We're not like trying to set out to create some hierarchy about who has it worse. Um, it's not a, a competition, um, but it is about acknowledging the differences in lived experiences so that we can more effectively dismantle the power structures that maintain oppression. We can figure out how to better serve every community member in our cities while identifying the policies and systems that keep them marginalized or excluded. As per Dr. Crenshaw's original definition, the impact of gender and racial inequality is further compounded by other forms of discrimination like we've discussed, like the class, class age, um, ability, uh, language, all those things. Um, we still focus on gendered intersectionality to maintain that focus on social justice. Um, because yes, men have complex and nuanced intersections of identity as well, of course, um, but they also all around have more privilege and access to power than women and girls. So we tend to always say gendered intersectional lens rather than an intersectional lens. Um, if we don't use this kind of framework um, to start thinking about these different experiences, we have to acknowledge that when we are talking about one type of discrimination, the dialogue tends to focus on the most privileged people of a group. So if we're not digging in deeper and we're talking about gender and the need to include women more generally, we're usually always talking about white women. So without a frame to help us see how these 
uh, pieces inter um, impact all members of a group, we risk leaving the experiences of the most um, historically um, excluded at you know be like at best overlooked and dismissed, uh, but at worst completely erased from the narrative. Um, and yes, I am I'm quite aware that the number of overlapping identities and experiences is infinite. Um, but just because we can't name them all doesn't mean that we shouldn't try to do better um, in our work as planners. So another key piece um, of how we think um, or what we think needs to happen in terms of policy making um, is the collection of disaggregated data in order to paint a clear picture of who the city is engaging, who is attending programs, who's being left out, who benefits from city funding, um, really just whose voices are being represented in decision making and whose are not. With a, a clearer picture, um, staff could design, you know, an analytical tool. I, I don't want to say checklist, but um, a tool that works for whatever program, you, you know, I think it would be program um, or department specific um, to ensure that you've considered the impacts of plans and policies on diverse women and girls um, and are developing responsive and equitable plans. So just for example, um, this chart here, this, this is data regarding the, the folks who ran for um, mayor in BC in the last municipal election. So the rainbow kind of all different colored folks at the top, those are all the men who ran with the most common names. So those are the Jims, the Johns, the Mikes, the Bobs, etc. cetera. Um, <clears throat> under it, the brown tannish colored um, icons, those are the women who ran. And then under that, the dark green um, people, those are all the other men who ran for mayor. Um, but aside from gender, we don't really know anything else about these people. And this is how we capture so much of the data um, in our planning practice. We talk about gender, but we don't drill down any further. We don't know how many of these women were women of color. We don't know how many disabled people, you know, men or women ran. We don't know how many young people ran. Um, and we see now that, you know, the majority of, I think it's like 18 out of 21 mayors in this region are, are white men. Um, but we just, we, we do this a lot. We capture a survey, you know, respondents. We had 200 respondents or we had 150 people come to an open house. But like, what does that mean? Were they white property owners? Sometimes we distinguish between, you know, check off this, put a little dot if you're a property owner or a renter. Um, but we don't get to see those intersections. We don't get to see who the young renters are, who the single parent renters are, who the, um, people of color, are, were they, were some of the homeowners, are they all white? Like, who are they? Are they seniors? We just don't know. We, we tend to categorize those d data collection points very in these finite boxes, and we don't get to see um, where they overlap and intersect. And so we aren't really understanding um, who, we can't really claim to know who we're excluding in our planning process if we're not d digging any deeper. <coughs> Sorry, I'm starting to get on a little bit of a rant there. Um, so I'm just cautious of my time. Um, so the third point, um, I, we realized that, you know, using developing and applying a gendered intersectional lens um, and the collect, um, collection of disaggregated data are both pretty time and resource intensive um, asks. Um, so at the very least, we encourage um, every city to create a women's advisory committee that reports directly to council and is not absolved during an election. Um, of course, we would hope that we don't need a women's advisory committee, right? The end game is to have diverse, equitable representation across, you know, from elected officials down to public engagement. And that gender equity was just built into every decision in every department. But in the absence of that kind of movement, um, a women's advisory committee is a relatively low cost way to start to highlight some of the women's issues in your city. Um, and in the absence of diverse voices at other access points to decision making, a women's advisory committee can play um, a key role in informing electeds and staff.
The need for equitable and diverse representation exists at each of these levels. Um, and we know there are individual structural and systemic reasons why some people aren't represented. Um, if this category uh, on the left, elected officials, isn't representative, then none of these tend to be. Um, we need to use that gendered intersectional lens to look at what is preventing women from um, participating in each of these categories um, and how each of these categories in turn maintains exclusion. Um, to be effective, um, this is, you know, it's really important for us to hammer home this, um, this point that an intersectional framework has to be top down. It has to live within every city department. Um, it can't just be with social planning or HR or um, programming at, in Parks and Rec. Um, those are obvious places where these sorts of initiatives tend to start, um, but it needs to include governance, it needs to include staffing, funding, it needs to be um, thinking about who, uh, budgeting, who is, you know, uh, benefits from the way that cities do their budgeting, programming. Um, the City of Vancouver passed a motion last year um, to apply a gendered intersectional lens to all decision making. Um, and actually, we were there for the city council meeting. Ellen spoke to it and had a great conversation with the councillors um, and resourced that work for six years. Um, so we're excited to see what comes of it. Um, and it is, I mean, it is a tall order, um, but we hope others will follow suit. Um, this isn't just about equity. Um, we also want to remind people that um, it's not about checkboxes. Women, diverse women, have innovative, creative, and new solutions to the problems that cities face. Um, and it's demonstrated again and again around the world that where um, places have more women in decision-making roles, different issues become priorities. Um, and the status quo is shaken up in really exciting and important ways. So I had some examples of policy cases that are taken from local municipalities that are anonymous. Um, and um, Normally, we would have an, you know, an opportunity to go through them and sort of think about um, who is and isn't represented and are these programs or are these policies targeting the right, the people that they think they are and where might there be some gaps. We don't have time to do that today, um, but I assume that these slides will probably get sent out so um, you can take a look at them and, and do some reflection. Um, there's a car sharing partnership, street naming policy, um, and public space planning. Um, we have a few um, upcoming, we've, we've just finished one, the Dare to Run, but we have um, two upcoming webinars that you're welcome to join us at um, on Monday, October 26th and Monday, November 16th. Um, <clears throat> they're pretty exciting. We have some fabulous guest speakers. Um, you can register on our website, womentransformingcities.org. Um, feel free to reach out if you have more questions about those, um, but I invite you all all to those. So just in closing, um, we recognize that there are many things on your desk and that you don't always have control over <laughs> your work plan, <laughs> depending on where you sit on the uh, uh, who's who in the zoo. Um, but you have a choice to make. You can continue to do planning and other city work business as usual. Um, or you can try to tackle your priorities thinking about those community members that consistently have the least amount of social, political, and economic power, women and girls. Um, if you remember one thing today, I hope that it is that planning, policies, and programs are not neutral. They are either benefiting or excluding others. We have to think critically about who they serve, who benefits from them, and who becomes further, further marginalized through their implementation. We can do that by applying a gendered intersectional lens to decision making, by collecting disaggregated data to inform our decisions, and by creating a women's advisory committee to hold cities accountable. And here's the thing, we're not going to get it perfect. <laughs> we're not going to meet everyone's needs. Um, we're, you know, we can't, there's not going to be one decision that, that is everything, you know, everything is not for everyone. Um, but we can see where there are gaps and where we might need to do um, a bit more work in including some groups or a bit more work in designing something that's meeting the needs of a group whose needs are not already met. Um, and just because we're not going to get it perfect doesn't mean we shouldn't try and think about how we can do better. So, you know, we just think it's time. There's a lot going on in the world um, that tells us that um, 
we, we need to get on this in a real and meaningful way. Um, and it's time for cities to start taking action to support diverse women wherever they can. So let's get to it. Um, thank you very much. And I look forward to getting some questions from you um, at the end. Thank you, Tasha. You presented a lot of positive uh, ways to move us in the right direction when it comes to social justice. That's great. Um, okay. So now um, I'll ask you, Tasha, to turn your webcam off. Thank you. I am going to invite Gwen Bridge, who is presenting from Nelson, BC. Welcome, Gwen, and thank you for joining us. As you turn on your webcam and your mic, there you go. Um, I will bring up your presentation. Please bear with me for a moment. Gwen will be presenting on indigenizing planning. Welcome, Gwen. Thank you, Sophie, and um, thanks to the Planning Institute for inviting me, and um, it's a pleasure to be here. As Sophie said, I'm in Nelson. That's on the territory claimed by the Tunaha, the Tanaix, and the Okanagan peoples. Um, and then I just want to, you know, make that acknowledgement when when Tasha did, and Tasha's super interesting presentation. I learned a lot. Thanks very much. Um, you know, everyone is making the land acknowledgments about um, indigenous people and the recognition. So I want to explore some some for, um, from a sort of macro and foundational level what are some of those fundamental concepts that we need to be considering as we continue to peel back layers about exploring a resolution to conflict um, in our society. And so my talk is indigenizing planning, but that concept of reconciliation is really at the foundation of my work, which is mainly to support indigenous um, peoples and their partners, whether they're government or industry, in developing relationships which are mutualistic. So. So the reconciliation and planning, when we think about planning processes, we're thinking about reconciling the process in my mind. And that's a, that's a macro point of view for sure. There's lots that can be done um, in various um, other areas that are addressing immediate needs, for example, the safety of people walking home from school or walking home from late night buses. That's really important. And I'll just relate a story. Um, I was an indigenous woman in Vancouver in the early 90s. My friends who were um, from Chile, actually, and they were like, okay, don't walk downtown. And I had to walk through Hastings Street to get uh, from my <laughs> locations where I was hanging out to my home in East Van. And so I would walk through down there and my friends said, you have to be really careful because um, indigenous women are disappearing and being killed and the police don't do anything. And so when Tasha was talking about that, it reminded me of that. And that was in 1991. And so it was recognized in community about these challenges, about these issues, about these bad things happening, and it just took so long. Anyways, it just sparked that memory in me when I thought about walking home in the dark at night and feeling unsafe. So um, thanks so much um, for, for bearing with that. Uh, reconciliation planning, so what do we need to know? We need to know how to reconcile our worldview. So I'll talk about a framework which um, I find is, is beginning to be helpful to people to begin to understand that. Why do we need to know that? We know it's the right thing to do. Uh, Tasha talked a lot about that, that will improve society. Um, and also, it's it's um, really to reconcile in terms of planning process the wrongs that have occurred before or address the challenges um, previously observed in planning. Um, and then what happens? We know it. We indigenize planning. We indigenize a process to be inclusive. And the indigenization of that process really begins at the very fundamental level and goes through a process of ethical space, which I'll talk about. And so then we'll have um, sort of the theme today of more equalized economic and societal benefits for all those who live there. Um, so I'll just, you know, you guys know this. Um, Vancouver certainly is um, one of the best cities in, in Canada for acknowledging UNDRIP, but it's Canada has now endorsed it, um, not legally binding, but it has principles. And then, of course, we know BC is going to be um, making sure that all future legislation is consistent with the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. This is fundamental background stuff. I'm not going to belabor this. Um, but the point here in the Declaration of Indigenous Peoples Act is that we really need Indigenous people to come forward and say, well, what does that mean when we uh, are attempting to fulfill the obligations that were um, described in UNDRIP? 
So under fundamentally, and this is a, a nice way that I like to boil it down, um, because to keep all 49 articles in your head is very, uh, <laughs> it's a lot of information. So essentially, UNDRIP requires the states to acknowledge and recognize Indigenous rights, protect those rights, and then pay to protect, redress, or mitigate impacts to those rights. So those, when you think about UNDRIP from a, from a high-level overview, those are, that's what it says. And it's an, the, the way that I'm doing my work to uh, create this um, reconciliation is to really use UNDRIP as a foundational component. So I'll talk about just a couple here that are relevant to planning. So, and you can, of course, read all of the articles. They're all quite good. Um, but this Indigenous decision-making institutions, so the right to develop those, and the responsibilities to traditional lands, waters, and other resources. So we know in British Columbia, a lot of the planning um, that has been done is land use planning or resource planning or those kinds of things which are more um, more rural in nature, I suppose, but there's um, also a movement to really think about the relevance of planning in the urban context and the inclusion of Indigenous voices in that planning as well. Um, and then this Indigenous people's laws, traditions, and customs and land tenure systems. So this key component here in British Columbia, and not so much for sort of the urban tenured land um, already, but there is movements among municipalities to really think about their obligations, even on um, non-crown land. But the fact that the previous systems of land ownership and land tenure are recognized. And when you recognize that, then you acknowledge that those things exist. Uh, this, this is an economic component, which is tying into some of the work in sort of the more economic development space, is the productive capacity of the land. And that means both the um, sort of subsistence uh, productive capacity, foods and, and medicines and whatnot, um, but also the um, evolution towards the economic, the productive capacity of other economic opportunities, for example, mining or carbon, these kinds of things. Um, I'll just briefly go through this. This is just a, a quick summary of sort of the history of the Indigenous involvement in planning in BC to 2016. Not a lot has happened in sort of more of the larger planning provincial context in British Columbia. And a lot of the work that Indigenous people are focused on is that government-to-government -government relationship component. There's some good examples, particularly um, out of Manitoba, and sort of we had to do regional planning together with cities and, and tribes or bands, but that's... Um, not the norm. Anyway, so here's a, you know, I'll just show you a graph on the next slide, but really we dove into all the plans, whether they were climate change adaptation plans, land use plans, um, regional management plans, various types of plans, marine plans, and really compare, uh, analyze them to these criteria. And I would add now, um, as this, this was back in 2016, just really this economic benefit component to planning, which is becoming more and more important for Indigenous people. So this, um, trend here is just really about, um, we can see that the plans are improving over time um, when they're done. So really we're, we're meeting more and more of the criteria in planning as we go forward. And that's really important because when we think about things like um, here, uh, the dispute resolutions being Indigenous, the Indigenous knowledge being included, uh, First Nations language, the process development, um, co co-development of process, that kind of stuff. We can see an improvement for sure. Um, some of the more recent ones here in 2016 are the marine plan. And as I, there's a bit of a gap from that point until now because um, less planning, regional-based planning has occurred um, with a focus on indigenous things through there. It's supposed to be improving with the modernized land use planning framework, so hopefully that gets back on track. So I just want to talk about reconciliation. Uh, you know, the reconciliation term, uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, really came from this, um, the commission in 2015. We need to reconcile. So it had 94 calls to action. You know, not, there's lots of things in there. Again, <laughs> you know, quite a lot of information. But one of the things that's not a specific um, call to action, but is a fundamental premise and assertion of the commission around reconciliation is that in order to reconcile, the first relationship that must heal is the relationship of indigenous people to their land. So we're really re acknowledging that the, even before all these 94 other things need to happen, we really need to understand that this relationship must be um, reconciled. Um, so what should you do to implement UNDRIP? So sometimes in this, um, in this presentation, I'll talk about legal and policy type areas. But in this, I really want to talk about the sort of the process of planning. And you know, we can have longer discussions with whomever likes about the sort of policy and legal components um, to, to talk about those. So 
Um, this is a, a pragmatic guide. So when we're talking about indigenous planning, this um, just came out last year. It's an updated effective practice guide on use planning by First Nations in British Columbia. So really coming at it from an indigenous or as indigenous as we could come at it from at the time, um, plan, approach to planning and sort of comparing contrasts, uh, planning approaches, um, legal analysis, best practices, this kind of thing. So I wrote that with um, Gregory Kim and Krista Robertson, and so that's out. That's um, walks. It's designed to walk First Nations step by step through a planning process. And one of the um, key findings from the interviews we conducted through the uh, analysis of best practice or the compilation of best practice is that when Indigenous peoples conduct their plans for their territory, for their city, for their land, for their um, area, whatever it happens to be. The most successful results, according to the First Nations, are derived from those plans which they've developed um, through their own initiative. Now that's to say, well, so they write their own plan and then they engage in um, relationship development around the content of that plan with a provincial government or other, or, or other partners, for example, could be a municipality going forward. So this is a bit of a contrasting approach to the approach that the provincial government likes to assert is that we should be doing this co-development of planning. Um, and that's good, and I think there's a way that we can get there, and I'll describe um, a framework for having those conversations uh, called ethical space in a moment. But the point here at this time was that really those um, the best practices that indigenous people do their own plans, develop their own vision for their land, and then, and then once that's articulated, work through um, collaborative planning. So that was a bit interesting. Okay, I'm trying to I'm trying to not only turn my volume up but stick closer to my mic. Sorry, guys, I can be soft spoken. All right, so um, we're just talking about um, yeah the best practices. So I'll talk a little bit about how to develop inclusion of indigenous people in the planning process through a concept called ethical space. Um, through um, what I'm calling principle-based intentions, MOU, the development of principles, how you design your organization to be ready for reconciliation. I call this the re rapid reconciliation readiness assessment. It's really looking at how your vision of your organization and how your um, willingness and ability to change prioritizes those areas which you need to focus on um, so you can move through a stepwise approach to advancing towards um, you know, preparation for reconciliation. Uh, creativity, and then really, I, I'd like to emphasize this, and I think, you know, Tasha did too, we really are in a place where we get to decide how things happen, and we don't necessarily have to be beholden to those old rules where um, where things are benefiting white men, essentially, right? So we have to look at it um, from that, how we make things better. So this is a, a, a simple a simple concept of ethical space, which I really uh, find very useful when thinking about what we're trying to create when we're trying to say we want to make things better. And it's a place where we take what's in Canadian culture, we take what's in Indigenous culture, and we don't merge them, we don't overlap them, we don't intersect them. We create something new in the middle, which is predicated on a deep understanding of what each of those out those sort of Western and indigenous circles contain, right? We have to know what's in those systems, really deeply understand so we can build something new. Reg Crochu here, I just want to give a shout out because um, this was great. His work in, in Voices of Understanding, published by the Alberta Energy Regulator, really great. Put a very eloquent frame to the work that I've been doing and how we describe um, the creation of something new. Oh, this is a blank slide. <laughs> because it didn't work, but this, luckily this content is on this slide too. So um, I'll just touch on this um, and hopefully that uh, I can explain it. Typically, um, you know, I can do longer presentations on this on this stuff, but really we need to, what I talked about, we need to think about what is in those systems. So sometimes I like to just draw on this a little bit and we, we tested it, it worked, so I'll um, try to make a no, I think my pen is still active. No, it's not. Pen active. Yeah. Okay. So going back to the the oops, sorry about the slide. The bubbles, 
here. What's in these systems? What are we trying to create? What we need to understand all of these things. So my in my work I determined that really what's in these systems is a lot of stuff. Obviously it's process policies, laws, um, day to day living management prescriptions. But and we have to when we are attempting to reconcile and we're attempting to heal society and heal a relationship of a society to its land base, we really have to understand how those societies are structured differently. And so it's an interesting, um, we hear a lot of stuff about, you know, loving the earth and, and hugging trees and if we just were, were more connected we could really um, change how things are. And my argument here is that's not enough, right, because the way that our behavior is constrained and guided by the societal structure requires um, that those things which are fundamental to our assumptions about authority in society are understood. So then we can have um, we can have pathways forward for understanding how things need to change, and not just conversations about um, you know blueberries picking here or wanting to log here. Those are those are important conversations, but they don't the reconciliation that occurs through agreement on a decision like that does not provide the depth of understanding necessary to create societies where two systems of knowledge and law are um, reconciled. And to me, when you're talking about reconciliation, you need to talk about, uh, <laughs> one needs to talk about um, really what we're talking about in, in terms of how we view our collective evolution. So my point um, when I talk about those kinds of things is that there's, um, this is like a, a, a dual, a dual hierarchy of authority. So it really kind of explains in this hierarchical fashion and um, you know I'm sure there could be other explorations and certainly I do not claim to have a, a pan-indigenous solution or concept but it's built based on my work as an indigenous person and in my work um, with various tribes in the states and throughout Canada. So I'll explain it and then I'll explain why it's important to understand this. So we have um, on the call this Western side over here, or Canadian, or whatever's coming out of um, sort of the Judeo-Christian <laughs> history and stuff. It's um, the authority is derived from God essentially, and it goes then through to the Queen, and then to the Constitution, uh, then legislation, policy, and then my argument here is science and management um, has very little inherent authority. On the indigenous side, the Creator, of course, which is you know we can all relate to that in terms of God and Creator, but the authority then from the creator is not divested to an individual or society, it's divested to the earth, which then relates the teachings and that authority through story, and then that story turns into protocols, and then it's into management prescriptions, and then living, right? So my point here is that if these are legislative frameworks for hierarchical authority, the information that's contained or you know created by the creator and given to the earth is a law. Right? So this is the highest level of the law. So this is all of the legal authority that's coming with that earth continues to guide and constrain the behavior in the lower levels. Right? And so then here we have also a sort of a God-based divest, divestiture of authority through to the queen and to the constitution. And I'm not suggesting that you know, we're a religious society. I'm saying that this is the legacy of our um, societal authority. Right? And so then what comes, of course, is you have the Constitution and the legislation, and these are viewed as sort of the law of the land. Well, where did that come from, and why is that law any more valid in a lot of in, in our society than um, an indigenous law, right? It, it's not. These are two equally valid and credible um, societal systems that exist, and I like to say, fr from the infinite possibility of the universe of options, right? And so there's no judgment here. They just they just kind of are what they are. The point I'm making is that there's a huge difference between how information and knowledge about um, systems and processes is used to change or influence um, the Western system. So when I talk about blueberries and something, we have science and management. We have earth knowledge. This science is a way of knowing the earth through observation, right? And we view it as credible and useful. Um, so it's it's a um, it's a good thing to do, but up here, this way of knowing the earth here, this is uh, also a way of knowing the earth from observations from this 
process of storytelling, all of that kind of stuff, right? So it's, they're the same. They're ways of understanding the earth. My point here is that typically what happens in planning, in science, um, a lot of the time is that it's expected that this earth knowledge becomes integrated or informs uh, a science-based plan or, or management plan down here, right? So it becomes subjugated to the science and management um, realm, which in this model really has no authority because the only way to have science make change is to have it influence policy and legislation at a decision maker's discretion. Right, so immediately you're taking this highest level of law and trying to um, integrate it, but essentially subjugate it to this. So I read an interesting planning set of planning recommendations out of the Policy Institute for guiding the provincial government in their um, land use planning and modernization. And they were saying, we hope this plan will influence policy. And they had asked me, well, how can we include indigenous knowledge in this plan? I'm like, OK, well, read the plan. And, and this was really striking because that's really what is happening, right? The science and management plan informed by best earth knowing attempt, often um, haltingly and in some cases with failure, and I'm thinking climate change explicitly because it has no authority. Um, so it tries to influence these levels, right? And then that continues to guide, guide um, behavior and ultimately people's living, right? Like they're living at the bottom here. <laughs> Sorry, my typing is not good with this particular pen. Um, so when we think about reconciliation, we're really thinking about understanding. When we're talking about ethical space and reconciliation, we're understanding that this, this um, fundamental difference exists in the way the authority and the behavioral constraints in society are provided. So in this case, like Earth provides the law, right? So the law derived from Earth is the plan, right? So it's, it's that already exists. There doesn't need to be a hope that some kind of plan will, will get legislated or get, you know, co uh, cabinet backing or whatever. The, the plan already exists. It's contained in the law and it just needs to be maintained in its articulation through to to that guidance. And so we're really trying to, you can see these arrows are, are operating in a different way. If this is planning, this is how, you know, the plan, this is plan, the plan is written already, right? And so I think that when we go into a planning process, um, typically when we think about, well, we're going to plan now, right? Let's figure stuff out, let's understand our science and we can really make the decisions. Those, those decisions are essentially, in a lot of cases, already made and that's why you have this I've observed some hesitation or resistance or reluctance for Indigenous people to really embrace um, the planning approaches that are typically um, endorsed or recommended by quote unquote planners, right? So I think that's an important um, important way to think about this. And, and you know, it has start down here. My point here is that, you know, we can all think about what levels we can influence. We can all understand our situation. We can all understand the others. Um, behavioral constraints and where they come from, but we're going to—it's going to take time, <laughs> you know. Ultimately, if we ever get to reconciling this question up here, and that's probably beyond my my uh, scope and lifetime, <laughs> right? But it's—it's—we're moving through a process. But fundamentally, when we begin to explore the differences and develop that deep understanding, which will predicate true reconciliation, we need to understand these concepts. Think about their relevance to our work and to our approaches, whether it's planning or any other type of, um, uh, well, it's a lot of it planning, whether it's climate adaptation or urban planning or land use planning or resource management, all of those types of things um, can be understood within this context as well. So I would just say, you know, to sort of reiterate my point and sort of come out regional or and organizational strategy around how to think through change and develop um, plans which will result in change or, or in the legislative system. It's sort of this typical planning or theory of change is that this, the decision will influence the system. Right? So if our system is either the earth itself, the natural systems, or it's our system of society, the decisions we make act on those systems. So we stop polluting water or we um, provide a new policy document, right? So these um, that's how it's kind of the acting, the, the act, um, the systems change is a product of a decision you make. On the indigenous side, I would like to just sort of reiterating this, 
reiterate this contrasting point, which is the systems tell us the decision, right? So it's very different. So stop polluting the water, but that, that's not a decision that needs to be made because the system has, through story, through stuff, provided the rules around water quality inherent in the story and the constraints on behavior. So the systems influence decisions about how you behave, right? So it's just another way to think about that sort of upending, if you will, or, or um, sort of inverse way of thinking about it. And then in ethical space, we talk about when you know when we when we start to think about how we how we understand each other and how we bring things together. For me, this is a fundamental premise of um, a lot of the the conflict, and I don't mean that sort of in a negative way necessarily around um, why people experience frustration through a, when they're trying to quote unquote include indigenous knowledge in whatever exercise is happening. So. Um, in ethical space, we talk about common goals. We really explore the assumptions, and you know, I hope that this presentation has um, been part of that exploration of the assumptions we're bringing, and then, and, you know, the challenges, and then really we can then begin to frame well, where, how can we think about the relevance of this conceptual framework, if you will, to our our work as individuals, as organization, and as a society as a whole. Uh, so a pragmatic approach, I sort of recommend, um, and you know, um, to to be clear, I'm working on a, a sort of stepwise approach to preparation for ethical space-based dialogue, I'm calling currently now the trajectory of awesomeness. <laughs> but it's like you have to understand, develop that deep understanding, then work on your internal organization, and then you can prepare for um, engagement with Indigenous people through um, showing up your deep understanding in the relationships. Only then can you really engage in sort of this ethical space-based dialogue. So um, what you can do is sort of what levels do you have the ability to influence? Do you understand the system that I've just described or an alternative mechanism of, uh, that First Nations want to, uh, other First Nations want to explore? Do I understand the significance of this, of the information that's being presented and, and um, really take a principle-based approach to leaving judgment and assumptions and not in the place, not <laughs> not in that ethical space, and then um, project visioning and planning process clarification. Like a lot of indigenous people are talking about, um, sort of land relationship planning versus land use planning, which is uh, so this concept of land relationship planning is something that's um, um, moving forward in indigenous planning. Uh, ca the capacity challenges and supports. We know that um, when we're engaging with First Nations, they have these challenges, how do we think through them, how do we address them and support First Nations. Community engagement uh, is an important component of many um, First Nations decision-making process, and so understanding that process and those decisions that come out of community are not necessarily made in a democratic fashion. They're made through uh, an alternative community engagement or decision-making process. What are those? And then, of course, trust in time, right? Like, it takes a long time to understand, to get our own um, sort of ducks in a row, if you will, or our house in order so that our organizations can prepare to engage properly, um, then you have to prepare for engagement. So a lot of times I think that there's this organizational um, enthusiasm for engagement before that exploration of are we internally ready to, to be participating in this dialogue occurs. That's um, Presentation again. Feel to feel free to reach out. I hope that um, it, it made sense because I did speed through it quite more quickly than typical. Thanks so much. Thank you, Gwen. Wow, what an enormous presentation! I will definitely have to go back and listen to your presentation again. There's so much in there that we all need to carefully look at. Um, you have given us a, a window of for a window of a new way of thinking about planning and approaching planning that makes so much sense to me. So thank you for, um, for your presentation. Um, and I, I would like to remind everybody that if you do have any questions for any of our speakers, please type them in the chat window located to the lower right-hand corner of your screen. Um, our presenters, Erin, Gwen, and Tasha, if she's able to, will come on board at the end. 
and um, answer any questions that you might have. So thank you again, Gwen. Um, and now I would like to invite Erin Rennie to show us how equity can be better integrated into regional growth management planning. Erin will be presenting um, her presentation entitled Social Equity in Regional Growth Management, a Jurisdictional Scan. Um, while she's turning on her webcam and her mic, I will move ahead to her presentation. Hi, Erin. Hi everyone, um, thanks so much Sophie and thanks to Natasha and to Gwen for their wonderful presentation. Erin, I'm sorry to interrupt, would you mind just coming a little closer to your mic? Can you hear me better now? A little better. I'm wondering if you can turn your, um, are you able to turn your microphone up a tiny bit? There's a down arrow next to your web, uh, your microphone icon. If you click on that and adjust microphone volume, you should be able to slide it over to the right. Is that any better? A little, yeah, a little better. Okay. I hope it's better for everybody. Thank you. Okay. Great. Great. Well, my name is Erin Rennie. I'm a senior planner at Metro Vancouver Regional District, and I work in the regional planning team. I'm located today in Burnaby, and I'm grateful to live and work on the traditional territories of the Coast Salish First Nations. My presentation today will focus on um, a study that I worked on last year with my colleagues Raymond Tan and Jessica Hayes and a team of planners at EcoPlan International. Um, and the study looked at different ways that uh, government agencies around the world are integrating the concept of social equity into their land use and transportation planning efforts. So I'll just start by giving a little bit of context about who we are here at Metro Vancouver and uh, the, the connection between social equity and regional planning. And then I'll dive into that study um, and focus really on the findings from that study, talk a little bit about the work we're doing in phase two this year, and then conclude with some reflections for practice. So Metro Vancouver is a regional district. That means it is a federation of 21 a member municipality, one electoral area, and one treaty first nation. And together, these members come together to plan for and deliver a wide variety of shared services, including everything from drinking water, to regional parks, solid waste and liquid waste management, and in our department, regional growth planning. And a lot of our focus is on um, planning for the growth in the region. We look at uh, things like transportation, land use, uh, and environmental sustainability. And um, our, our major focus is on working with municipalities to write and implement the regional growth strategy, which is called Metro 2040. And that is a long range regional plan um, that articulates the shared vision for how this region will manage growth um, over the coming decade. It's made up of five uh, core goals that you can see on the slide here. And under each of those goals are a number of strategies and actions for municipalities and for Metro Vancouver to carry out to achieve that vision. And while Metro 2040 includes a number of strategies that, uh, that, that um, implicitly refer to, to social equity and, and concepts around social equity, it doesn't explicitly have a policy statement or a definition around social equity. Same thing for our recent policy research. We've done some work on housing and the transportation cost burden and transit-oriented affordable housing, but we haven't yet specifically delved into um, talking about social equity. But over recent years, there's been a growing um, understanding and recognition that many of the region's growth management challenges could potentially have a connection to social equity issues in, in society. And that connection could work both ways. So there could be ways in which growth management policies, strategies, and actions are benefiting um, social equity issues, but they could also have a negative impact. Um, 
and by the same token, there could be social equity issues in society that are um, impacting the region's ability to achieve its, uh, its growth management objectives. And one example of how that works here in Metro Vancouver is, um, well, as a region, we have, like I said, a goal of creating a compact urban area, and we have a target of achieving carbon neutrality in this region by the year 2050. But we also have a number of social equity issues in the region that are impacting our ability to achieve that. And those include things like um, income inequality and rising housing affordability issues. And that is leading to more and more people living further and further away from their place of work. And that puts development pressure on areas outside of urban centers and um, and uh, impacts our ability to achieve that compact urban area and um, and to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And so that's just one um, uh, illustration of what that connection might look like. Another motivation for doing this research was um, the, the ongoing desire to address inequality experienced by Indigenous peoples in Canada and to continue efforts towards reconciliation. And then finally, uh, another piece of the connection here is uh, what uh, some people call the curb cut effect. And Angela Glover Blackwell describes this so well as uh, the way in which laws and programs designed to benefit vulnerable groups, such as the disabled or people of color, can often end up benefiting all of society. So if you think about a curb cut in the corner of a sidewalk where the sidewalk um, uh, goes down a little bit to meet to meet the road. Um, these curb cuts were initially implemented in our cities to benefit one particular vulnerable group, that is, uh, disabled veterans who use wheelchairs. But unintentionally, those curb cuts ended up benefiting society as a whole, and now all sorts of people who are using wheel devices, from uh, parents to strollers to elderly people using a mobility aid to delivery people using a trolley can all more easily access the sidewalk and get around their neighborhood uh, with more freedom. And so it's just a beautiful example of, of this effect of what uh, an economist might call um, a positive externality. And so we think about that, about how um, interventions that, uh, that are intended to benefit some vulnerable groups can often end up benefiting everyone, and that has implications for all public policymakers, including urban planners. So uh, with all of that in mind, we scoped the uh, social equity and regional growth management study, and the intention here was really just to take a first step by looking around the world at peer jurisdictions to Metro Vancouver, agencies similar to us, and see what they were doing to integrate um, uh, to embed uh, the concept of social equity into their land use transportation um, uh, policy plans and practices. So we brought on uh, consultants from uh, EcoPlan International, and together we uh, drafted this working definition of social equity so that we were all talking about the same general idea. So uh, we we used this definition. The social equity means the promotion of justice and fairness and the removal of systemic barriers that may cause or aggravate disparities experienced by different groups of people. And this can include the many dimensions of identity, and I've listed a number of them there. And so the intention here is not to have a final version of, uh, of this definition. Um, it was it, The intention was to refine this definition through the course of this, uh, this research. So, Together with our team at um, EcoPlan International, we began with a desktop scan looking at the academic literature around the connection between social equity and planning. Uh, they developed an evaluation framework, selected 12 different uh, peer jurisdictions around the world that um, and, and took their planning documents and scanned and reviewed and reviewed those planning documents. They then did um, interviews with planners in those jurisdictions. And they used all of that information to do a bit of a gap analysis and develop some recommendations for Metro Vancouver. So I'll quickly run through some of uh, the findings from the research. And I won't go through all of it because um, 
uh, it's quite extensive and you'll see that there are some, some, some patterns, some re repeating themes. But starting first from with the findings from the academic research, some of the key themes coming out of the current literature on the connection between social equity and planning include the idea that social equity should be pursued both in terms of the planning process and the planning outcome. A theme around the idea that reasonable economic growth tends to be more robust when the social equity is at the heart of that reason planning. Um, the importance around bringing a broad approach to equitably integrating Indigenous interests as a lens to be applied across departments. And that additional efforts should be directed towards clearly specifying social equity objectives and measures to ensure that equity goals can be adequately translated into action. When uh, we did the interviews with planners around the region, some of the key points that we heard again and again were that um, uh, the benefits and disadvantages of both urban growth or uh, redevelopment planning policies and no growth or neighborhood preservation policies have um, uh, impacts that are inequitably distributed among groups and individuals in a community. So what that means is similar to the point Tasha made, uh, growth planning is not neutral. It impacts different people in different ways. And so it's so critical to understand that, to measure it, and then to um, consider how to mitigate those impacts to support more equitable outcomes for growth planning. Um, planners are, uh, from jurisdictions around the world emphasize that governments and agencies have histories, and those histories are often uh, connected to uh, discriminatory policies, and it's important to be aware of those histories, especially when engaging with equity groups. They emphasize the importance of defining social equity and being clear that equity is different from equality and it is different from geographic equity. And, uh, and defining social equity really clearly can avoid confusion when you're doing this work. And then they also emphasize the, the benefits coming from uh, inclusive engagement practices to support plan development. So that could include any practice that Remove the barriers of participation. So providing transit passes or childcare at meetings, offering accessible events in accessible venues, and um, making sure your materials are translated into different languages. These are all ways to improve um, the accessibility of uh, engagement practices. These are the 12 jurisdictions that, uh, that the consultants uh, looked at. These are all uh, jurisdictions that are taking some steps to integrate social equity into their work. And based on the scan of those 12 plans, they developed a, a list of recommendations for regional policy. I'll just highlight a few of them. One of those recommendations is to consider integrating uh, social equity into all aspects of a, of a plan, everything from the way the plan is written, thinking about uh, using plain language, or even bringing in um, indigenous language into components of a, of a planning document. A recommendation around acquiring the right data to support storytelling around equity issues in a region. And, okay, and um, the importance of looking at uh, targeted investments and targeted policies to prevent or remediate uh, known inequities. Um, they also emphasize the a recommendation around uh, bringing in some equity performance measures and then continuing to collaborate, collaborate with regional partners uh, to address these issues. So we've taken some of these recommendations and uh, built them into the scope of the work we're doing this year in 2020. Uh, this work will focus on um, three components. We're doing a, an equity baseline data report, we're doing um, some stakeholder engagement with equity seeking groups. And then we're, we're uh, the, the consultant that we've hired to do this work will take the learnings from those two tasks to develop an approach for applying a social equity lens to regional policy. So I want to leave you with a few of my personal reflections uh, that, that may be beneficial for fellow practitioners from what I've learned um, working on this topic over the last couple of years. Um, I'll start with the idea of resisting 
the the whole notion that you know, social equity is just not an issue here in Canada. That's a common narrative that I've heard over and over again. And I think it's it's an idea that many Canadians grow up with that these are problems from the past and now we have multiculturalism and we've solved these problems and uh, and everything's fine in Canada. And I think it's it's really important for us to recognize that while Social equity issues look different in Canada than they may in the United States and other parts of the world. They are there, and we need to continue to um, to work towards to more more equity in in our country. Um, it is of course important to be prepared for defensiveness for tough questions. Um, this is a sensitive topic, and so we can't be surprised when uh, when people get defensive. And uh, so it's always so important to monitor your own emotional process and leave space for others to to um, process their own emotions as they're working through these, these sometimes difficult topics. Really recommend that any planner who wants to work on a social equity issue get in touch with the public health practitioners in your community. Um, the field of public health has been working on social equity for many, many years. And so I think planners have a lot to learn from them. I know I've learned a lot from my counterparts at Fraser Health and Vancouver Coastal Health and the BCCDC. So a lot of gratitude to them. Um, I think it's so important to bring a sense of humility and listening and patience. We're not going to get it right the first time, just like Sarah, uh, Tasha said. And so we need to be ready to make mistakes and to learn from them, to get corrected, and to commit to doing better the next Again, give yourself lots of time to, to make those mistakes and to learn from them. And especially if you're intending to do some inclusive engagement, um, it takes more time than you think it will. So build that into your, um, your planning process. And keep learning. Um, I, I hope that we, we're all uh, experiencing a renewed commitment to, um, to learn more about social equity issues and, and our place in the world especially if you're coming, like I am, from a place of privilege. Um, we're all in a different place in our learning journey, but it's never over. And uh, one great tool for continuing that learning is Jay Pitter's um, equity learning agenda that she released. Uh, it's a great little template. And so some of the, the people on our team have gotten together and we've created our own learning journey, uh, agendas. And we meet every two weeks to talk about what we've learned about social equity. And so that's a great way to hold ourselves accountable, and uh, to have some great conversation as a team. So um, that study that I talked about is available on our website. Um, if you have trouble finding it, please reach out. Um, or if you just want to chat or you have some questions, my email. Right. Thanks again for your attention, and I'm looking forward to some questions. Great. Thank you, Erin. What you presented is a very useful starting point for planners to consider equity issues in their planning work. Um, I would like to invite, oh, I was going to invite all the other uh, speakers to join you on camera. Um, Gwen, if you're there, Tasha, Erin, um, you can come back. Thank you. I'll just wait for the other speakers to log on. I don't know if Tasha will be able to join. Oh, there she is. Okay, great. And uh, I'll turn my webcam on just to make it even there. OK. Um, normally, at this point, we have a question and answer period. But not seeing any questions, um, and also being, um, being aware of the time, I think what I'll do, oh, someone is typing. Um, let's see if we can get a question in. A couple of people are typing. OK, we'll take a few questions. Type quickly. OK, so Claire Dubois uh, has a question for Tasha. Tasha, do you know if there are existing WAC in BC, and if so, where? So I guess she's talking about Yeah. The Hi, Claire. Um, I'm pretty sure that the city of Vancouver has the only women's advisory committee. Um, yeah, I'm, pr I'm pretty sure that that's true. Um, they are also one of the, um, like, they, do, they report directly to council, which is not true for all of the advisory committees. Um, yeah. I think, I don't know what else I can say. <laughs> 
Great, thank you. If there are any other planners out there that do um, know of advisory committees um, happening in your community, uh, let us know. Um, any other questions before we go? Lisa Colby, I am just processing all the fabulous information. Well, thank you, Lisa. It was fabulous. No question, but thanks for the extremely interesting presentations. Agreed. Um, amazing presentation. Okay, uh, I think we'll call it a webinar then. On behalf of PIBC, thank you once again to our speakers, Erin Rennie, uh, Gwen Bridge, and Tasha Henderson for their wonderful presentations today. I really appreciate your time and your effort. I know um, it's a lot of work, especially when you have little ones, right Tasha? Um, so it was, uh, I also would like to thank the Real Estate Foundation for making it possible for PIBC to present this very important webinar for free to all, um, all viewers. We will also be putting it on our YouTube channel so it will have um, a wider audience. And if you're a PIBC member, please remember to claim 1.5 organized structured CPL units for this webinar. And if you're a, a speaker who's a member, you can claim three units for this webinar. Uh, and that would be you, Erin, right? <laughs> um, so in terms of upcoming webinars, we have um, on October 28th a, a, a webinar which is very similar in topic. It's called Climate Justice and Equity, and um, we will have our co-chair of the Climate Action Subcommittee host the webinar, and we are working on our speaking, speakers list. Um, again, I think, I'm pretty sure it's going to be a very informative and eye-opening webinar, just like this one was. On November 25th, we will be looking at affordable housing policies and planning. And then December 9th, of course, we have our free uh, webinar, Annual Pecha Kucha PIBC Style. And this one is um, a lighthearted webinar, um, given that we deal with so many um, important and um, heavy topics throughout the year. And this one, again, is sponsored by the Real Estate Foundation of BC. So thank you again. And on behalf of PIBC, thank you, everyone, for joining us. And again, thank you to all the speakers. And uh, we will call it a webinar. Bye Thank for you. now. Thanks, Sophie, and thanks to everybody else on the panel. Bye bye. Very welcome.